So Kate, I'd like to start with you. Um, Kate, your donut framework has powerfully shaped the conversation about sustainability. As I mentioned, I personally use it in all of the orientations for uh, master students around MIT to, to, to introduce them to the topic of sustainability. And um, it has shaped the conversation at multiple scales from planet to country to city and even to corporations and supply chains. Uh, so could you share a bit about this work and what it has taught you about why metrics matter? Yeah, great. And let me just say, I'm just really excited to be having this conversation. John and I have never actually spoken before. We've exchanged a few emails and his work's massively influenced me over the years. So I'm just really delighted to have this chance. So the donut, here it is, on a stick, down on a stick. Um, there's loads of metrics here, but I, I'm not primarily motivated by metrics. I think metrics are a brilliant way of using numbers to bring attention to things. So for me, the, what metrics do is invite us to choose what we measure. And when we choose what we measure, we're actually revealing our worldview. We're revealing what we think is important and what's in, not important, what's in the foreground and what's in the background. In fact, let me start with a quote from John, which I quote in Donut Economics. Uh, as John says, the most important assumptions of a model are not in the equations, but what's not in them, not in the documentation, but unstated, not in the variables on the computer screen, but in the blank spaces around them. And when I was a student of economics, I found that the most important issues that matter were just not in the diagrams that we were taught at all. Mainstream economics says, welcome to economics, here is supply and demand. And we stick supply and demand in front of our noses on day one, as if to say the economy is the market. That's a really big assumption. But two, it immediately privileges price as the metric. Oh, the metric of economics is price. And suddenly that's the number and, and, the, and the metric that we're dealing with and anything that falls outside of the price contract gets now labeled an externality. And bingo, you've just told us that the death of the living world is apparently an environmental externality. So to me, the metrics we choose actually reveal the worldviews we have and what we choose to privilege and make visible and measure. So I love using metrics as a way of actually putting something else in the center of our picture, in the center of our vision. And that's why the donut comes in here. So moving away from GDP as the metric of 20th century economic progress to the idea that our well-being lies in a donut. Ridiculous though that may sound. So the, so the idea here is leave nobody falling short in the hole in the middle of the donut, get everybody over that social foundation. These are drawn from the sustainable development goals, food, water, healthcare, education, housing, income, political voice, and the beauty is we then get an opportunity to use metrics to say, well, what is the measure for people? How much energy is, is enough to say people have access to a, a sufficient minimum amount of energy? How many calories? What quality clean water, clean water? What kind of healthcare? What kind of education? So it suddenly invites us, this conversation about metrics invites us actually a conversation about human rights. It takes us to the deep of the heart of what are our values and what's the basic minimum that everyone has a claim to. But then don't overshoot the outer boundary because that's where we put so much pressure on the planet, we start to break down Earth's life supporting systems. And these are the nine planetary boundaries drawn up by Earth system scientists in 2009, so recent. But again, it invites us to say, well, what are the metrics of this ecological ceiling? Here for carbon, for example, they say it's 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And suddenly we're talking in a whole new kind of language. And I haven't mentioned money yet, but this is to me is the beginning of 21st century economics. This is the goal of the economy to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And the metrics by which we are setting these targets and, and laying down our values are not economic, traditional economic metrics of dollars. It's parts per million of carbon dioxide, it's tons of nitrogen, it's the hole in the ozone layer, and it's the metrics of human well being. So this invites us to say perhaps. It's time to thank Simon Kuznets for the incredible work he did in the 1930s of drawing up the US national income accounts for the first time. By the way, he gave us the caveat from day one and said, look, this is not the measure of a nation's welfare. I think if Kuznets were alive today and he had access to the data richness that is now arising, he would say, guys, let's just leave that single number aside. That's not getting us to where we want to go. Let's have a dashboard. Let's measure 
human well-being and nature in nature's own metrics and humanity's own metrics. And let's be brilliant at visualizing this so that we have a far, far richer picture that reflects the complexity of life because life is complex. So let's not reduce that complexity and flatten it. Let's keep it. And then we give ourselves a far better chance of actually meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet and thriving. Yes, yes. And then those economic metrics become means to those ends as opposed to ends in themselves. Uh, exactly. John, you have used simulation tools to bring metrics and quantification into complex debates around climate change, around sustainable growth uh, with policymakers and companies. What have you learned about the role of, of metrics and measurement here? Well, so first of all, Kate, it's great to have this conversation with you. And Jason, thanks for moderating it. Uh, so I fully agree with what Kate was saying. Let me just um, try to address the question that, that you brought up around metrics. And, and to do so, let me back up. So the, the reference to Simon Kuznets is terribly important. And I do agree that if he were working today, he would be developing broader metrics and helping to create the dashboards that we need. But underneath all of that is the way that we have taken these metrics that we had when the National Income and Product Accounts were first created and uh, become slaves to them, right? GDP growth, it's a fetish in our societies uh, because, well, there's many reasons for this, but one reason is we confuse the thing we measure with what's really important. And there's a way out of that, but the other part of this is to remember that we choose what to measure. So within living memory, going back to when Kuznets was, was doing his work, there were no national income and product accounts. There were no reliable metrics for customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, uh, uh, mental health issues in the general population. The general social survey didn't exist. Measuring well-being or happiness or however you want to think of that, it didn't exist. And what we know is that people have become very good at creating the metrics for the things that we've chosen, uh, that we've recognized as being important and more fundamental. And so what's measurable is not given to us, it's something we create. And we're in this era now where, starting with the work you mentioned out of uh, uh, Stockholm Resilience uh, and Johan Rockström and John Foley and all of those folks, uh, beginning to measure the different planetary boundaries. And then of course, the social story here. Um, so what's the role of, of simulation in all of this? Uh, and it's really to help people learn for themselves. So one of the things we know from many, many decades, maybe centuries or longer is uh, you can't tell people things. Uh, anybody who's a parent and whose children are old enough uh, knows that you can't tell, tell them anything. They have to learn for themselves. And your job as a parent is to make sure that they learn important lessons for themselves in a way that's safe. And when we think about that at the planetary level, uh, it's just like learning to fly a new aircraft. It's too dangerous to say, hey, Kate, here, here's the keys. Take it out for a spin. You'll learn as you go. That doesn't work. It's too risky. When you crash, it's too late for you. We'll have the black box, but you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just too risky. And with the planet, it's, it's of course exactly the same, but the consequences are much, much larger. So simulation is essential because it's the only way. It's not just the way that we can integrate all of the knowledge and metrics and understanding of complex dynamical systems that we have, but it's the only way people can learn for themselves about this. And one of the things they learn is exactly this point about expanding the boundary of their mental models. What do they consider to be important? And that was the gist of the quote that you uh, mentioned at the beginning. People are very smart and very clever, but everyone has limited attention, limited bandwidth, limited experience, and nobody can understand the whole system in which we're embedded. The mental models guide what we think is important, guide what we want to measure, guide what we do. And the real purpose of simulation is to help people expand those mental models. So I'll give you a real quick example that's I think directly relevant here. In our En-ROADS, climate policy simulation, uh, 
users can choose what levers to pull, what actions to try out in the simulation model to try to limit global warming to a safer level. Two degrees C, the Paris upper limit, of course, is not safe. It's just less harmful than where we're going without dramatic emissions cuts. And what, having done hundreds and hundreds of these interactive workshops with everyone from middle school students through members of our Senate and Congress here, governors, other senior policymakers, most people immediately gravitate towards levers that can increase the production of zero carbon, low carbon energy, more renewables, uh, uh, let's get rid of the coal, et cetera. And this betrays a very important mental model. And that mental model is that we need more energy. Well, nobody needs that. Nobody wants tons of coal, barrels of oil, cubic feet of natural gas. What people want is to be warm in the winter, cool in the summer, have access to economic, cultural, educational opportunities, decent health care, to be free from fear. And energy is a means to that end, but it's not the thing we really want. And when you make that shift in the simulation, people eventually come around to that view and they start working on things like, well, we should dramatically improve energy efficiency. And how can we do that in transportation, in the built environment, in industry? Um, and they find that it's enormously uh, important and has high leverage. And actually, when you expand the boundary of your model to consider the so-called co-benefits for health, for jobs, for safety, for equity, and social justice, what you find is it actually pays for itself. So the real purpose of simulations, Jason, is to help people expand the boundaries of their mental models and see the couplings between what people often think of as disparate domains. Oh, mm -hmm. we have a climate problem, and we have a social justice problem, and we have a health problem. It's overwhelming. They're all different. Well, they're not different. And one of the great things about the donut is it helps people see those connections and begin to search for the solutions that can lead to win-wins here. Great, great. The importance of measurement doesn't always correlate to the ease of measurement. So part of what we're talking about here is, is what do we call important and therefore what do we put work into measuring? Um, but then there's also certain measurements um, yield to that effort and some are, are, are harder, kind of harder to get at. So I wanna get sort of a, um, a snap, your snapshot of the state of play with measuring the various things that are around the donut, if we think about, um, you know, what what are some of the topics that are, you know, important and where you're seeing improvement in both measurement quality and the attention that we're getting on measurement. So what what's the good news in measurement land, Kate? Yeah, great. Okay, so if I go back to the donut. Um... So in terms of measuring the planetary boundaries, the Earth system scientists are the first to say, we, don't, we, we know that chemical pollution, meaning all human created entities from plastic pollutants, persistent organic pollutants, nuclear waste, even GMOs, it's a human creation. We don't yet know how to measure that uh, at a, a macro scale or even air pollution, we don't know how. So these are unmeasured. And they, it's really important to identify we need to measure this and then leaving that blank itself is a political act, it's a research act, it stimulates others to say, right, we need to answer that and develop those metrics. Yes. A space where there's good news recently is here, a measurement of biodiversity loss. Um, it's traditionally been done through species extinction, you know, background rate versus the background rate. And we know that species are being lost far more rapidly to 100,000 times faster than the background rate. But just that's not what we are ultimately care about. We care about the web of life. We care about the intactness, the, the, that web of interconnections. In fact, here we are, <laughs> my favorite toy. This is what we care about. We care about interconnections of things, right? Now, how do you measure that? If each node in this beautiful wall was a species in an ecosystem, how would you measure the extent to which that's intact? And I was talking to some of the um, biodiversity scientists recently who were saying, actually, we're now coming up with a new measure of bio biodiversity intactness, because this is moving towards what we need to know, not has a species been uh, made extinct or not, but 
it's about the relationships between, right? It's about systems, not objects. So it's about the systemic relationships between these uh, species and their interaction. So there is movement on this. And again, let's just remember that the, the planetary boundaries framework is from 2009. I mean, this is so recent that we actually, just over a decade ago that we said, we think these are the life supporting systems of our planetary home. And so the science is running fast. And of course, the, the tragedy is we need it yesterday and it's going to be coming tomorrow. So it's a real fast catch up of the science to, to manage those boundaries that we know that we need. So that's definitely improving. And then when we go into the social foundation, look, we could say we don't have the level of detail that we want on all of these. I've been working with cities in the global north, like in Amsterdam, you know, one of the wealthiest cities in the world. But we don't have the, the granularity of data even that we want on food and health and education in Amsterdam. Now what happens if we go to Freetown? That data is not there, but what we do know is what is there is people with smartphones, with mobile phones. And if we can create new ways of gathering data that enable people to enter their own data that gives you some kind of proxy, it's not the same as a national survey, but gives you some indication of people and their self-reported do you have a roof over your house? Is your house flooded? Do you eat a decent meal every day? You're beginning to generate bottom up data and it's live. I mean, it, it can be regenerated uh, frequently. So we're beginning to have access because the, the, the internet is in so many hands in the world. It means we have what people you know, talk about this kind of digital skin of the world. And we can begin to gather this data in a way that's just never been possible in the past and I say this almost breathlessly because look there are so many crises we face we face such challenges but let's celebrate the opportunities we have which are distributed digital technologies which mean that we can generate energy on a rooftop we can have knowledge and creative commons passing through every node and every hand that the ability of ideas and information to spread is utterly unprecedented we have to celebrate that and make the most of it and know that we can collect data that never in the past could be collected from humans but also from trees from the atmosphere we can measure nature's breathing almost in real time so we have no excuse but to manage this far far better than any generation before us because we have a level of data that no one before us ever had are there issues where they you know, even with that um, level of reach of digital technology are proved to be difficult to quantify, you know, maybe maybe even conceptually, like oh. justice or equity or social well-being. I mean, are, 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 we, are, we, are we, are there places where we're at risk of looking where the light is under the lamppost? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I think what Kate's describing in terms of you know, the, the granularity and frequency of data, it, it really is uh, a terrific innovation and we need to exploit it, but it's not everything and it's never going to be. And just as an example, I think, well, there's a famous story from the Second World War in the beginning of operations research where the, uh, the analysts wanted to know where should the armor on the bombers be placed? Because you, you, you only have so much weight you can put on. And what they did was they took the data from the aircraft to see where the shrapnel and bullet holes were after being attacked. And they put the armor there. And of course, that didn't work because of the selection bias, where the aircraft that made it back had the shrapnel and bullet holes where it didn't matter. And the aircraft that didn't had those holes where it did. So it wasn't enough just to get the data. You had to understand the larger system here. And we are definitely at risk. We see this now with the proliferation of uh, d huge data sets and then machine learning and other AI tools that are being used to extract meaning correlations, relationships from those data. And they have actually reinforced systemic racism, gender problems, and other inequities in our system. You know, facial recognition doesn't work very well for people of color, for example. Systems that are based on uh, putting the police resources where there's the most crime reinforce systemic racism because they don't seek the crime in the um, neighborhoods where there hasn't been a history of oppression. So you have all of these problems. So I think what I would like to stress is absolutely these data are important, but there's 
tendency sometimes to feel that once we've got this massive data set that we can download from the internet uh, and interrogate in real time, that's all we have to do. And that's just not true and it's never gonna be true. We, we need to make sure we don't lose sight of the qualitative data that comes from being out in the field, the personal experience, the what people in the intelligence community call ground truth. Um, and uh, I, I do worry that that's losing uh, it. You know, it's harder to do. Everybody says, well, that's just an anecdote or that's a small sample. It doesn't mean anything. Well, that's not really true. And the qualitative work that comes from immersive ethnographic field work and lived experience in the places that are suffering on the social and environmental dimensions uh, there's no substitute for that. And not just because it shapes what you can measure and interpret the measurements you've got better, but because it's the empathy generator. You can look at graphs and maps all day long. It's not going to generate empathy uh, the way living for a while in Kibera might, for example. Can I add on there a, a, another point I really really like what John's saying, but also, uh, so quantitative data, powerful, yes, but never enough. We need the qualitative. And I want to say that quantitative data tells you about what's happening at a point. And again, something I learned massively from John's work and, and, and from Donella Meadows, what really matters is the relationships between. So it's all very well having all these data points, but what are the relationships between? And it's too easy to fall into looking for correlations, which may be just a passing trend in part of a much more complex system. And I, I think coupling the acquisition and creation of data with deeper understandings of systems dynamics is just essential. I just want to tell a little story here because I was in a debate with a, actually with an ecological economist, I was pretty taken aback. Uh, an ecological economist a few years ago who I was saying, you know, we need to teach students seven ways to think like a 21st century economist. And one of these ways is get savvy with systems and we need to learn systems thinking. And he said, he said, oh, systems thinking, that's far too complex to teach to undergraduates. I was just <laughs> amazed that he said that. Right. And <laughs> and right. so at the beginning of lockdown, <laughs> I, have, I have twins living at home. My kids are first year, second year school, beginning of lockdown, suddenly, okay, I'm homeschooling. There were no, there was no classes online. They were just at home. So I thought, right, what can I teach my kids? And I, I discovered a, a chapter from a book by John years ago called Sustaining Sustainability. And to me, it was like the most succinct introduction to the core concepts of systems thinking. And in fact, I wrote John an email, dear Professor Sturman, I, <laughs> we had a nice little exchange because it's the, it's the chapter I recommend to all my students. If you want to get the basic concepts, read this. So I took the basic concepts and thought, let me just start with feedback loops. And I taught my kids, age 11, got about a whiteboard. Okay, come on, homeschooling, mum's teacher now. Right, we're going to learn. Reinforcing feedbacks, the more you have, the more you get, the more you have, the more you get, it spirals up or it spirals down. Balancing feedbacks, you know, the more you have, the less you get back. And I taught them these two feedback loops and they got it. And we played with some funny ones. And then I said, okay, coronavirus and I drew two feedback loops in the middle of the diagram you know the more people are infected the more people who will get it and the more people who stay home the fewer people get it and then I handed over the pens and my kids drew and I'm going to show you now what they drew share my screen that is not what they drew this is what they drew yeah love it they just drew I, I you know I just I stood back and they just went crazy with it. And there's beautiful stuff about the more people who stay home, there's more people playing music in their gardens and a number of nurses feeling happy and protected, appreciated. And if you look on the left-hand side, there's a lot of people staying home, but then you look down, there's more pressure on government finances. And so they went from what they immediately knew about infection rates to how people were behaving, pollution in the streets, pressure on the government. I tweeted this and actually thousands of people liked it because I said, you know, who's this professor who tells me that undergraduates can't get system thinking? I mean, my 11 year old kids loved it. And my daughter, she was literally jumping up and down. She was saying, I can express what I want to say about the world. She was so empowered by it. So I want to say that, yes, let's collect data, but let's teach systems thinking Absolutely. to kids from this age because they just were so empowered and so expressive. And I know it's, it's seeped into the way they think. 
So, so this is yeah. really great. And empirically, we know from our evaluative studies that what that professor told you that kids can't learn it is just dead wrong. They can learn it and not just, you know, anecdotally with your kids or, or my kids, my son's first feedback loop diagram uh, was the, uh, a, he was six, I think, uh, a diagram uh, that he, to explain a reinforcing feedback loop. And I, I said, you know, can you think of one? I didn't prompt him at all. And he came up with seeds lead to trees, trees make seeds. And I still have this, I'm not gonna show it, but uh, well, pretty proud of him. Uh, and, but the evaluative studies of larger scale interventions where teachers in the United States and elsewhere, all the way down literally to kindergarten, have successfully taught systems thinking skills and not just feedback loops, but stocks and flows, um, nonlinearity, epidemic disease, uh, absolutely can do it. And in fact, in, um, in Linda Booth Sweeney's studies, and she was uh, uh, a doctoral student of mine, even though her degree is from the Harvard Ed School, um, her research field studies with middle school students showed that they often did better at uncovering the feedbacks and other relationships than their teachers did. And, and I think that raises the interesting possibility that kids have the innate potential to learn systems thinking. Everybody does. But once you have gone through the educational system the way it's currently configured, it's not only that it's never developed, it's often actively taught to you that the other way, the linear, sequential, open loop, uh, blame-oriented perspective that is so common in our society. And then it's harder for you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if anybody's interested, there's a lovely uh, nonprofit group in the, the US called the Creative Learning Exchange that works to provide as a clearinghouse curriculum materials and help for teachers who want to introduce some of these concepts into their, into their classrooms. I've worked with a number of those teachers and their students, and it's a joy. It's really a pleasure to see what, what they can do. Kate, you said that um, you found John's chapter, Sustaining Sustainability, to be a really useful primer on systems thinking. And I think that's um, true for the audience of this Sustainability Summit. Um, in that paper, one of the things that John lays out is the challenge around growth. Um, and, 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 the, and the idea that the reinforcing feedback loop of the growth of human activity um, both population and, and economic consumption and so on um, are kind of a, a fundamental driver of our depletion of, of planetary resources. Um, on your donut, growth is good on the inside in some ways because it might grow access to the social foundations if it's done right, but it, it, it's clearly in, in, a, in a challenge with, those, with, the, with the planetary boundaries. And yet, as you both said earlier, growth metrics um, GDP and the growth of GDP have dominated our culture. Um, so how, what are the alternatives for understanding human flourishing and progress other than growth? And how can we drive uptake of those better measures? Well, I'm happy to kick off here. Um, I never travel without a hose pipe because this is essential for me. Again, I love metrics because they make things visible. So I find it really important to make shapes and patterns and dynamics visible. And here we are, that's the shape that we tell ourselves and have told ourselves is the shape of progress in the 20th century. And that shape, exponential growth curve, sits under every political speech, every business meeting, economic journalism. And it's what we're told is success in our own lives and our kids should have more than we had and up it goes. And no one actually asks what happens when you get through the ceiling. But that's the shape. Now, let's reflect, you know, growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life. We love to see our gardens grow. I just showed you my kids. I love to see my kids grow. They've been growing about two inches a year and they're actually eye to eye with me right now, which is kind of intimidating. But nothing that thrives in nature grows forever. This is not nature's growth curve. This is nature's growth curve just a little flick of the wrist and it changes everything. It's the S curve, the logistic curve. Things grow until they're grown up and then they mature 
And that is how they come to thrive. And if we say feedback loops, you know, there's a phase of reinforcing feedback and then something tips and the, the natural world moves to balancing feedback. If my kids keep growing two inches a year, they within five, 10 years, they literally can't fit into my house. They can't sit at the table. They do not belong. So the idea that we think growth is good, I mean, we, we, we're so stuck at one end of this metaphor. Oh, but growth is good. I think, really? You know, we actually already know the other end of this metaphor. If I told you my friend had been to the doctor and the doctor told her she had a growth, this immediately makes us go very quiet because we actually already know the other end of the growth metaphor. We know that when something tries to grow forever within a healthy, living, dynamic, balanced whole, that is a threat to the health of the whole and we do everything we can to stop it. So we already understand that at the bodily level. Why is it therefore that we think that our economies would be the one system to buck this trend and somehow succeed by growing forever? And it is my favorite question to put to economists. I put this question to Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England the other day. You know, this is nature's growth curve. So how is it that we think our economies are gonna succeed by bucking this trend? What would it mean for an economy to grow and then grow up? And to me, that is the existential economic question. How do we take the growth dependency out of our economies? Where are those reinforcing feedback loops that demand endless growth? Uh, and I would love to know if John could think of a, a simulation game that could help people really get inside the feel of this and, and, mm. and take economists on that journey and start think, thinking really seriously, where are the growth lock-ins, those dependencies, and how do we start to design to remove them? Well, so that's, of course, what many people in my field uh, have been doing since the 1970s, the early 1970s, starting with Jay Forrester's World Dynamics and then the Limits to Growth and all the follow-on studies to that. And of course, the fundamental message, as Herbert Simon once told me, he said, you don't need a model to understand that the earth is finite and growth cannot continue forever. And of course, that's exactly right. But that's a conclusion people hate because there are all of these social stories that we tell ourselves that growth seems to provide a free get out of jail card for. So the trickle down story of, uh, well, everybody's getting richer, the rich keep getting richer. I don't have to change the way I live. I can aspire to have more and more stuff and consume more and more and have more and more homes and bigger and fancier cars every year. And that's okay because the poor, they're gonna grow too. Well, on a finite planet, growth cannot continue forever. Growth of anything material, nothing real can grow forever on a finite world. And you know, when I introduce this concept in our classes, even in students who are, and executives who are sustainability oriented, there's a lot of pushback because what happens is people just, they're forced to confront the idea that they may not be able to reach their personal aspirations to always have more year after year in a world where that won't be possible for the billions of people who still don't have what they need. And I think this is a really important point for people like us who are privileged and in this conversation white and are from the rich economies. We have more than enough, but there are billions of people who need more. And I, you know, I think we ought to have a little bit of sympathy for the old economics that focused on material production because that emerged in an era where people were poor, people were hungry, people didn't have basic needs met. And that's still unfortunately true for so, so many people in the world. Those people need more. They need clean water, reliable electricity, access to healthcare, educational opportunities. They need um, decent jobs, et cetera. Uh, and we have an obligation to help them um, in ways that are best for them and only they can tell us what those are. Uh, and that, so you're suddenly confronted with, wait a minute, you know, we're going to have some conflict here and we're, we've got to face up to this. So what you hear from students is, well, but we're going to leave the planet and go colonize Mars. Seriously. Uh, or uh, we can dematerialize. So GDP can keep growing forever because it's going to be less and less materially impactful. That's, of course, impossible. I asked them for suggestions. What would it look like? And they say, well, you know, um, 
everybody's going to uh, have a lot of um, uh, Netflix and uh, do a lot more yoga and mindfulness exercises. And I'm asking them, well, you know, how much electricity does the internet to provide all that Netflix to you take? And how much carbon dioxide is generated by that? And uh, where do you think your yoga mats are going to come from? And, and aren't you going to still need a place to live and food? And don't you want transportation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, people are looking for that free lunch, that out, because it's just supremely uncomfortable to face up to the finiteness. Jason, at the very beginning, you, you used the phrase sustainable growth. And as you know, that's impossible. And yet you go look at website after website of companies, including the companies that are most out front on sustainability and other institutions like the World Bank. And almost every single one talks about our goal is sustainable growth, impossible. And just makes people deeply, deeply uncomfortable. And I wanna say also, you know, I love the S-shaped curve and growth and then growing up, but that is not the only possible outcome. The other outcome is what we call overshoot and collapse. And oh, this yeah. has happened many, many times to humans, including not all that um, long ago with, um, for example, the Irish potato famine, yeah. which is a wonderful, I mean, so a horrible, millions of people starved to death and millions more emigrated because they had no choice, mostly to Canada and the United States. But it's such a terrific illustration of the confluence of the environmental biogeochemical systems, the limits of the earth, and the social and political. Uh, so they built a monoculture dependent on the potato that made them vulnerable to disease. The potato blight came, wiped out the food supply, millions of people are starving, and Britain wouldn't take them in. That's the political story. And very, very similar to the EU and other nations and the United States not welcoming refugees and migrants, many of whom are driven out of their homes by the looming ecological failures uh, that then lead to the conflict that drives them into uh, leaky boats in the Mediterranean or the trek up from Honduras and Guatemala to the southern border of the United States. These things are intimately connected. There's no, you know, people talk about, um, you know, the, the people, planet, profits perspective, and they draw these three circles that overlap in the middle. We have to, you know, the, and the old, that's better than the old model. The old model was profit. You know, the, the business of business is business. Milton Friedman perspective, shareholder responsibility is to grow. Uh, managers have nothing but uh, the, the duty to grow profits. At least the people, planet, profit perspective is better than that. But it's fundamentally wrong to think of these things as three domains that we can trade off. The better model is that the economy and every business is fully contained within a society and that that society, including the economy, is fully contained within the environment. They're not in opposition. People think about it, it's growth versus green. It's, it's spotted owls versus loggers. Uh, that's just not true. What's true is if you destroy the environment, you destroy people's welfare, you destroy our lives. And it's also true that if people are hungry, oppressed, have no opportunity, they will cut down the last tree, catch the last fish, and eat yeah. the seed corn. And everybody in this Zoom call right now would do the same thing if we were desperate enough. So there's a fundamental alignment here between the physical environmental side of sustainability and the political, social, human well being side. Yes. And if I can just show a picture. So instead of ever starting economics with supply and demand, I always start with this picture, which is what you just described. And I call it the embedded economy diagram. Right. So it's from ecological economics, uh, feminist economics and commons theory. So it says, as John just said, the economy is embedded in society, it is a human construct and society embedded in the living world, drawing in materials and matter, putting out waste and pollution, bathed in a river of solar energy 
And then within the economy, yes, okay, there's the supply and demand of the market, but there's also the state and the household of unpaid caring work and the commons. And for me, if we start economics with this picture, this is the big picture of the economy, then gosh, the metrics that you could gather around this, but also the relationships between and the power relationships between. Every time I begin with this, amazing conversations come out of the classroom and everybody can recognize that they are players in the market and in the state and in the household and in the commons, mm -hmm. and that we have to ensure that the economy is fit for working with and within the living world. It's fully consumed within it and must be compatible with the conditions conducive to life. So I'm just coming back to where I began, the, the power of the pictures that we put on the page and what's left in the blank spaces in between and what we actually make visible. And I think any student today who finds themselves in an Econ 101 class that says, welcome to economics, here is the market. I mean, that is just such a derogation of duty to give the next generation of policymakers a chance to have a worldview that's big enough for the challenges that we face. Okay, the, this picture that you just showed and the donut itself um, describe a set of planetary boundaries and social foundations that it's easy for me to understand how to think about those measures at a global level. And I can even think about that as sort of a national level, like maybe what is our allowance of those things or what is the social foundation of those things. And you mentioned working with cities in the global north like Amsterdam. How do we translate this whole perspective to business? Because a company could grow if it was replacing other companies and the whole economy might actually reach that sort of um, S-shaped curve that you're describing. Um, are, does this, so, so I guess there's sort of two questions there. One is if we, when we translate this to a company or supply chain perspective, um, does our concept of growth and growing up change? Um, and, and two, what, how should we think about the metrics that companies should be managing if, if, if what we're talking about is a commons and, and, and companies might have to think about their sort of fair share of the commons if they're trying to carve up those planetary boundaries to their own corporate level metrics. What, what have you seen as good practice in that arena? So important question and complex. I'll, I'll bring in two thoughts and then um, invite John to add more, I'd love to hear. Um, I think the most important things are to transform the dynamics of what our economy are bringing about in the world. So I'm not going to talk about the growth of revenue of the economy, the first thing, or of the company. First thing I want to ask is, is this company degenerative by design? Is the way this company does business running down the life support systems of the planet, right? We have, we've inherited linear degenerative companies. We take, make, use, lose. We need to turn them into circular, cyclical, regenerative companies that through the very business practices are regenerating soil, regenerating the living world and using materials in a cyclical or circular way. And I think we've inherited companies that are divisive by design that have often been designed to capture as much value for the owners of the company as possible. That's what, that's what maximizing shareholder returns is. That's the fiduciary duty, isn't it? That's just one design of an enterprise. What about if we create businesses that are distributed by design that share value far more equitably with all who co-create it. So I think the big dynamics we're looking for, in our, whether at the national economy scale, whether at the city scale, or indeed within business, if we want to thrive on this living planet as humanity, we need to move from degenerative to regenerative, from divisive to distributive. When I talk to companies, what I really want to talk to them about actually is the design of the enterprise itself. And for this five design traits that I take from the brilliant corporate analyst, Marjorie Kelly. So I have them here on a stick. The, the benefits of lockdown is that everything ends up on a stick. Um, so I always say to a company, I don't wanna talk about the design of your products. I wanna talk about the design of your company because this is gonna tell me what the feedback loops in your company are doing. So one, what is your purpose? Why do you even exist? What are you here in service of? Are you here to be the biggest four by four retailer in Europe? Or are you here to provide 21st century mobility? As John was saying, it's not energy we want, it's warmth and comfort. So actually go for a higher purpose, a living purpose that's bigger than yourself and be in service to it. Two, what are your networks? How do you relate to your customers, your suppliers, your competitors who might turn out to be your allies? And how do you ensure that you reinforce your values through those relationships? 
Three, how do you govern yourselves from who has voice, who's even in the room, what are the metrics, the rules, the principles, the practices, the norms and the culture of your business. But now let's get down to the really powerful stuff. How is your enterprise owned? Because whether it's owned by founding family, by a startup entrepreneur, by its employees, by the state, by venture capital, by shareholders, all these ownership designs exist in the world and they all have a profound influence on what's here at the bottom with the strongest feedback loops, which is finance, which is where's that finance coming from? What does that finance expect? Does it expect a reinforcing feedback of double digit returns every year? And how are profits distributed? Are they indeed gathered up and extracted for the owners or are they reinvested in the purpose of your enterprise? And to me, if I look every every enterprise that I engage with, I look at through these five design traits. And to me, it enables me to be a detective of whether or not that business is stuck in the 20th century extractive mode and it just won't be able to make the leap or whether it can actually become part of a regenerative future and redesign itself. And these two, of course, how you're owned and how you're financed, these are the killers. These are the big ones that are going to get you stuck. Just last week, right, Emmanuel Faber, the CEO of Danone, Danone, he was driving that to be a purpose company. He was part of so many networks, the Renewable Energy, uh, the Renewable Energy 100, the biodiversity movement. He was governing it in a different way. He was showing carbon adjusted earnings per share, really innovative stuff. Along come so-called activist uh, investors, more like extractive investors, who just get them chucked off the board. If you're split, you've got your purpose, networks and governance going towards a regenerative future, but you're pulled back into extractive enterprise by ownership and finance, you ain't going to transform. So to me, rather than the metrics of a company, I want to look at its deep designs because this is going to tell me what kind of system dynamic that enterprise is going to generate in the world. Yeah, so just a couple of thoughts stimulated by that. So every uh, every semester I ask the students after doing a, a case that speaks to these issues, so what do you think the ultimate purpose of a corporation is? Uh, is it to make money and then you know the owners, whoever they are, who earn those profits can do whatever they want with them. They can spend it on self-satisfying consumption or they can try to improve the world. Or do you think the ultimate purpose of the corporation should be in some fashion to make a better world? And the very first thing that all, is always said is, but wait a minute, if we don't make money, we will go out of business. And, and my answer to that is, of course, in the same way that uh, if you can't breathe, you're going to die, but breathing is not the purpose of your life. What is the ultimate purpose of the corporation? And having done this for many, many years now, what I've observed is it used to be maybe two thirds make money, let people improve the world if they want to, and one third uh, make a better world. And now it's about the opposite. It's by no means the majority, and you can criticize their answers as virtue signaling and performative, and I think that's got some merit to it, but there's definitely been a shift. Now, the tricky part is how do you get that to happen? Because when you're sitting there in the boardroom or as a product line manager in the company and you're told your budget just went down by 5%, but your earnings target just went up, you have to do more with less. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to cut corners, you're going to compromise quality, you're going to abuse your workers because that's the nature of the system in which you're embedded. So I'm, I think it's great and I'm going to keep doing what you're doing, which is talk to leaders in corporations about ultimate purpose and see if they can construct how they're going to meet that ultimate purpose, however they design it for themselves. But I don't think it's realistic to believe that that's how we're going to get the transformation we need. I, it, you know, when when Walmart uh, embarks on waste reduction, packaging reduction, renewable energy, those things are highly aligned with their business model, which is take cost out, remove waste, non-value added time. And they've been brilliant at doing that. And it's a wonderful thing, but it's very far from sufficient because it just increases people's disposable income because they pass those savings on in lower prices and grows their sales or grows the sales of other companies when people now have a net increase in their disposable income. It's impossible for me to imagine that Walmart is going to voluntarily say, we don't want to grow anymore. Or Amazon will say, we don't want to grow anymore or any company saying we don't want to grow anymore and the what they'll say is if we don't somebody else will if we don't we can't create the great 
services that we provide and our products are always better than those of the competitors in their minds. This is something that can only come from a broader collective societal pressure. And that means people have to demand that our, the instruments of our collective will, that is the government, make the changes that would lead to the grown-up phase in your picture, Kate, uh, where uh, and, and what, what would that look like? I think we have some ideas about what it would look like. It would look like uh, higher marginal tax rates on the affluent. It would look like uh, stronger penalties for practices that companies use to maintain growth that undermine social, ecological, and other dimensions of well being and human rights. Um, I, I just can't see companies suddenly saying, we just don't want to grow anymore because we'll be exceeding planetary boundaries. So we're going to need collective action there. And government is the expression of the collective will of the people that is essential to bring that about. Totally agree with that. And although I do think there are some enterprises that are set up precisely to sequester carbon, to bring community oh, sure. health, right? And, and they're using business as a vehicle, as you're saying, of course they need to make profit, otherwise they can't open the doors next week, next month, next year, but that's not why they exist. They exist uh, using business as a vehicle to make transformation happen in the world. And those companies don't have this inbuilt drive to growth because of the way they're owned and financed and purposed. But those that we've inherited are absolutely structured to grow. And I totally agree, there's no way that's going yeah. to come voluntarily from within. It needs regulation. Yeah, and you know the, the unfortunate reality is, uh, as as wonderful as those companies that are genuinely sincere about not growing and running their business in a way that respects human rights and the ecological boundaries of our, of our finite world, there's going to be there are. If you, I mean, if you just think about carbon offsets, uh, which you mentioned, there are lots of other companies that, whether intentionally or not, enter the market, offer those offsets at a lower apparent cost per ton of carbon dioxide removed or avoided, uh, but it isn't real that, you know, it, it, they're, they're doing things that, that don't actually help with the climate problem. And so self-regulation here is great, but it's not going to work in these domains. I think the record on that is quite clear and in health and safety. Uh, so we're going to need that collective will of the people focused on what really matters, uh, expressed in the kind of regulations that level the playing field for everybody and still move us in the direction of a more sustainable world. And just bring us back to metrics, if I can give an example of regulation that I'm impressed by in Amsterdam, which is always only one part of the puzzle, Amsterdam, as within the Netherlands, has committed to being 100% circular economy by 2050. Now that's a you know, man on the moon goal because we don't know what it looks like until we try and get there. Who knows what 100% circularity means? So they've got this big transformative 2050 goal. 2050 is way too far away for any goal, we know that. So then they've got a decadal ambition. 50% of the materials in use in our city need to be circular materials by 2030. So that's less than a decade away. And these materials are going to have a material passport of where they've come from and how they can be used again and again. We're talking about construction, food waste, textiles. But that's still too far away. They say in 2022, 10% of the procurement of the city of Amsterdam will be circular materials. And now they want to put in place, obviously, taxes that stop taxing companies for hiring workers and make it so cheap to use new materials and reverse that. Right. When I see that, you know, 2050 the goal, 2030 ambition, 2022 commitment to purchase, that to me creates that playing field. It gives a long, loud legal message to business. If you want to do business in Amsterdam, you're going to have to be circular from now on. In fact, there's an opportunity next year to be the preferred provider. That just enables the next generation of students to start using their new design skills, their new materials, their circularity. You know, you mean I actually get to use the qualifications I earned? I don't have to put them away and work for an old company. And I see an energy unleashed in that city that I am not seeing in the country I live in or other places. So to me, this is a really nice, clear um, counter to the idea that we love growth. Actually, it's boundaries that unleash our creativity. Any architect will say, just don't give me a blank piece of paper. Give me boundaries, give me parameters, and then Absolutely. I'm going to get creative. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, my 
brother is a professional musician in, in jazz and various other genres. And what he says is, uh, you know, when, when we're jamming, when we're improvising, we still have the chart. We still know the fundamental story of the piece that we're improvising off of. And without that, it would just be chaos. So I, I fully agree with that. I do want to, I mean, so Jason knows this, but you know, the students at, at MIT uh, have given me the nickname of Dr. Doom, which I actually don't <laughs> like, although I've kind of embraced it in the following way. Uh, the reason they have is it's my job to, to tell them the truth about what's really going on in our world, ecologically and in all the other ways that the donut captures. And as smart and wonderful and capable as they are, the vast majority of them have never had any training in ecology or any of the other disciplines that would you know, give them that information. And it's quite a shock for them. They don't like it, but it's fundamentally important. Um, I, I just worry that, so the big challenge for us is, is we have to tell them what's really going on and invite them to challenge it and poke at it. And you know that's when the data comes up. Um, but uh, we have to do it in a way that threads between the kind of denial on the one hand, oh, don't worry, the market system will, will solve all these problems or don't worry, technological innovation will solve all these problems. It always has, has so far, which of course isn't true, just ask the global poor, the systematically oppressed, it hasn't happened for them. It's happened for a small privileged minority, but that's what they say. Uh, and and that's, that way leads to overshoot and collapse. On the other hand, some people's reaction to facing up squarely and honestly to what's happening in the world is despair. It's too late. People will never be moderate. Human nature is fundamentally greedy and selfish, and uh, we're running out of resources, and there's nothing we can do about the climate problem. And that's equally unproductive. And so along with the metrics and the data and all of that, which is absolutely essential, we have to find a way to thread between these two failure modes, uh, a kind of denial on the one hand, everything's going to be fine. And on the other hand, uh, despair, it's too late. And uh, you mentioned my mentor, Dana Meadows, the late Dana Meadows. And one of the things she always said on this score is, you know, if you believe everything's going to be fine because the market or technology will come to the rescue, uh, we're just going to keep growing. We're never going to face up to the realities here and we're going to experience overshoot and collapse. On the other hand, if you believe it's too late, then we're going to overshoot and collapse because in a world where it's too late, it's, you know, everybody for themselves, uh, lifeboat. Uh, ethics and will collapse as well. And so the middle way that she tried to construct is the idea that it is still possible, barely, that it is still possible to create a more sustainable, just, fair, and equitable world. There's just exactly enough time to do it with no time to waste, just exactly enough time, just exactly enough innovative capacity, just exactly enough money and resources to do it with not one second to waste. And I try to live that way and it is hard. It is very hard to live that way. Uh, and nobody can do it perfectly. But I do think we've got to find a, a way through the emotional minefield here to help people develop hope and hope, hope for us is, is not the idea that everything's going to be okay. If we don't take some big actions, make some big changes, it is definitely not going to be okay. It's not okay now, and it's going to get worse. Hope is not a prediction. It's the stance that what we do can still matter individually, but especially collectively. So let's get busy. So I, I, I love... Sorry, we're, we're we're reaching the end of our time, so I wanted to see if you have any any parting parting thoughts. Yeah, I would absolutely love to respond to that, and I I just concur. So I, you know, it's hope. People say we need hope, and you know what we don't need is hope with its fingers crossed. Right. What we need is hope with its sleeves rolled up, right? Exactly. Hope in action. And also, people sometimes say to me, "Oh, I love your optimism," and I say, "Really? Did I did I say that? You know, don't be an optimist if it makes you relax." 
everything you just said, John. Oh, we'll sort it out. Humans are ingenious. And no, because that is not going to happen. But don't be a pessimist if it makes you give up and say we are too many. It's too late. It's too hard because you will make that self-fulfilling. So yeah. be in action. Be an activator. And John, I really don't, I, I can't believe that you could be called Dr. Doom because when I find your work, it is a powerful tool that empowers people to understand the world in a way they haven't before. So I'm going to rename you Dr. Dynamics that, because that's no. where you are. And you're I in don't know if it'll and, stick. <laughs> and you're on the case. I don't so, know if it'll stick with the students, but that would be great. Well, I'm going to stick it right now. There. So, you know, there's a, there's, there's a wonderful, um, quote from a poem that Thomas Hardy wrote uh, and you know you anybody who had to read his novels in high school knows that oh my gosh they're depressing right they're the, the struggles of people to overcome their place in a class system or their circumstances in life and generally speaking they fail and he was he was the doctor doom of the social strata of 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 his era and, and was widely criticized for this. And so he wrote a poem about this. And in the poem, he says, if a way to the better exists, it begins with a look at the worst. And I think that's what we're not generally willing to do. We need to look at the real situation we're in. It is not a pretty one. It is not a happy one. And things are getting worse fast. At the same time that for some people, things are getting better, uh, but not sustainable. And at the same time we do that, it is not enough. It's not enough to point out the problems. You cannot beat something, the growth economy founded on the myth of endless exponential growth. You cannot beat something with nothing. We've got to do the hard work, sleeves up as you say, to create the alternatives in every way, environmentally, biogeochemically, organizational design, economic design, how we live our lives, how we teach ourselves and our children, uh, we're going to have to have alternatives that will work and that help people see that actually that's a, that's a world I want to live in. That's a world where there's joy and there's contribution and there's well-being, not just for myself, but for everybody. That we can do. I absolutely believe we can do it. But as Dana said, there's no time to waste. And it comes real every day in the classroom when we decide which models to use and which metrics we tell ourselves matter. And I, I never met Dana and she's absolutely one of my top heroes. So it's really great to connect with her through you. And I just want to thank you again for your work. You are not Dr. Doom. You are absolutely Dr. Dynamics because you've completely empowered me and changed the way I think about economics. And I know that's had impact on many, many other people. So including, including us, and, and including us, it's had, your, your work has had a tremendous impact here at MIT. And we're very grateful to have had you here for this, for this dialogue. So thank, yeah, you. thank you, Kate. Cheers.